That was testimony from Catherine Rada, a crime scene investigator in the Yesenia Sesmas case. Welcome back to Law and Crime, everybody. I'm Jesse Weber. So Yesenia Sesmas is a woman who is on trial for the murder of a mother, as well as the kidnapping of her baby. And I'm wondering, as we finished day one and we're waiting to enter into day two, that's right, we're waiting for the live feed in that courtroom, how's the prosecution doing so far in their case? I wish I had a great guest to help me. Oh, wait, I do. I do. Former federal prosecutor Francie Hakes is joining me right now. Francie, it's great to have you here on the program. Thanks, Jesse. Nice to be with you. So tell me, how's the prosecution doing so far on day one of this case? Well, they're doing as well as the state or the federal government usually do. That is, they're putting up their best witnesses. They're building their timeline. They're making their case. They're uninterrupted, really. They have this great opportunity to do opening statements and then prove to the jury exactly what they told them they were going to prove. I think they're doing a great job so far. What do you think their strongest piece of evidence has been so far? Was it the testimony of the responding officer who saw Laura slump there in the couch? Was it the testimony of Manuel Gonzalez, the father of baby Sophia? Which do you think impacted the jury the most so far? Well, I, I think that whenever you have crime scene photos, whenever, especially when you're talking about a, a young mother who's recently given birth, those are incredibly impactful. And the prosecution has a delicate balance to strike here. That is, they want the jury to feel uh, the horror so that they understand the nature of the crime, although they don't want to horrify the jury, but they have to show crime scene photos. And so I, those were probably, at least thus far, the most impactful item. I have to tell you, yesterday when we were covering this and we looked at the body cam footage of Gary Jordan, the responding officer, it, there was no audio, so I was actually, um, I, I was basically narrating what was happening, and we didn't know that that body was going to be shown to the jury, and it was a very, very gruesome sight. So it's not just us who saw it. As you said, Francie, the jury saw that, and I'm sure that resonated with them. What we're going to do is we'll take a quick break, and when we come back, Francie and I are going to talk a little bit more about this case, but we are also anticipating the live feed in that courtroom. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. This is Jesse Weber on the Law and Crime Network and Law and Crime on Sirius XM Radio Channel 109. We are covering a lot right now. We are waiting for the live feed in the Asenia Sesmas case out of Kansas. But before we go there, we are also in verdict watch in another major case that we've been covering here on Law and Crime. That is the Sean Harrison case out of Massachusetts. This popular reverend in Boston who is charged with drug charges, gun charges, as well as the attempted murder, charges in connection with the attempted murder of a high school student named Luis Rodriguez. Harrison was a dean at the English high school when it's alleged that he recruited Rodriguez to sell drugs for him. They had a dispute over decreased drug sales, and according to the prosecution, Harrison lured Rodriguez out one night and shot him in the back of the head execution style. So as we wait for the verdict, let's try to anticipate what might happen. And it's no, it's no easy task, and it's very hard to predict, but we should analyze what has happened so far. Uh, before we do that, this is the closing arguments from both the prosecution and the defense. We have a short, excuse me, a short report recapping all of this so you know where we're at right now. Take a look. Prosecutor David Bradley called defendant Sean Harrison a coward who left 17-year-old Luis Rodriguez to die on the streets of Boston after shooting him in the head. He did everything possible to commit a murder. He shot him in the back of the head. Rodriguez miraculously survived the attack and pointed to Harrison as his attacker. But the defense says Rodriguez's earlier stories conflicted with his testimony. Rodriguez could not identify anybody who shot him. He didn't know who shot him. <clears throat> the defense says Rodriguez claimed his attacker was someone who was there to buy his drugs, and he failed to name the defendant until much later. But the prosecution says packs of marijuana, guns, bullets, drug scales in Harrison's apartment, and text messages link him to the attempted murder and the other crimes he's charged with committing. The prosecution also says the evidence backs up the testimony of several witnesses whose sketchy pasts would otherwise have been problematic. This tells you what was going on. This. These bags of marijuana, they were in Mr. Harrison's house, they were in his apartment. He had a drug lab going on. 
The defense told jurors police found much of their evidence in a common storage area where many others, including a possible alternate suspect, had access. In a tactical move, the defense did admit to three firearms and ammunition charges, which related to items handed down to Harrison without proper permits. But the top charges, including attempted murder, remain contested. This is Aaron Keller for the Law and Crime Network. Thank you, Aaron. Let's talk a little bit more about this case as we wait for the verdict. Joining me via Skype is former federal prosecutor Francie Hakes. Francie, I want to talk about the Sean Harrison case and what's going on. We know the jury has been deliberating for quite some time, even though that's not really fair, not quite some time, about four hours yesterday, maybe another hour and a half today. Uh, before we jump into that, just want to let our viewers know, all of our viewers, that is a live feed into the Asenia Sesmus case. We're going to jump in there in a second. But before we do, Francie, what do you think the jury's really going back and forth on is it the is it the shooting is it about the shooting charge the um the shooting of Luis Rodriguez because they might be settled on the drug charges and the the gun charges what do you think their back and forth is with the shooting though yeah i think there's there's understandably a conflict in the jury room between the image of this man the preacher the counselor the teacher and the man the drug dealer the man who might commit a murder and I'm sure the jury is doing what jurors always do. They're going through all the evidence. You probably have a few people on each side of the issue making arguments sort of on behalf of the prosecution and on behalf of the defense. And then they go through evidence again, and everyone looks at their notes to see what actually happened during the trial. What did the key witnesses say? So it's usually a very deliberative process. I'm not surprised it's gone on uh, for several hours, for sure. Not an easy task for them in this Breaking Bad style case of a reverend who is allegedly leading a double life. Francie, stand by. We have a live feed right now into the Asenia Sesmas case. The jury is not present. A witness is uh, being questioned right now within, uh, outside the presence of the jury. Yesenia Sesmas is on trial for the murder of Laura Abarca as well as the kidnapping of her baby. Her baby, six-day-old baby Sophia. Let's go live into that courtroom. And again, the prosecution is continuing their case. Welcome back to Law and Crime, everybody. This is a live feed into the Asenia Sesmas case. A woman who is on trial for the murder of a mother as well as the kidnapping of her baby. Um, this is a really, really sad case. What's happening right now is the medical examiner is being questioned outside of the presence of the jury. The specific issue is they're going over photos that will be allowed to be admitted into evidence. The defense is objecting to the extreme close-up of the gunshot wound to the victim. Uh, well, let's bring back in uh, Francie Hakes, uh, former federal prosecutor. What do you make of this, Francie? Well, Jesse, this is a classic outside the presence of the jury session where the defense is claiming that evidence in the case, that is evidence that everyone agrees is legitimate evidence, is what's called more prejudicial than probative. That is, it has no real value other than shock value to the jury. And so the prosecution has to prove to the judge that these photos are necessary to prove some legal element of the case. This is very common in murder cases and in child pornography cases where the defense wants the jury not to see things that are gruesome for fear it will sway them toward conviction. But I guess the legal issue here, the, the real probative issue, the thing that matters here is if you can show that it was a close-up shot at close range, this was more of a calculated kind of killing than it was um, an accident or there was a sign of a struggle, right? Wouldn't that be the way to think about it? That's right, and I'm sure that's where the prosecution is going, is that this is not going to be shown to be some crime of passion, something that happened without uh, prior forethought or premeditation, that it was someone taking a gun, placing it against the skin of the victim, and pulling the trigger very deliberately, and that's what these photographs apparently show. I want to note something for all of our viewers. As we pan into this courtroom and you see the defendant, Yesenia Sesmas, there's a woman sitting next to her. That is her translator who is transcribing the proceedings as they unfold. Just want everyone to be aware of that happening. Um, we're going to jump back into this courtroom in a second as soon as we have audio, as soon as there's something happening. Um, they're just going over a few matters right now. Uh, we'll make sure to jump back in there in a second. But, um, Francie, the, the, that's an interesting point. The idea that this could have been an accident, and we kind of heard the flavors of that from the defense yesterday in their opening. So the idea would be, and correct me if I'm wrong, that Yesenia went over to Laura's house with a gun, um, threatened her, give her her baby, and the gun just 
accidentally went off. Is that even a possibility of working? Well, you know, you never know what's going to work. And frankly, it's much harder to convict women than it is to convict men when you're talking about crimes of violence. The jury, it seems like we as a society and the jury as our representatives want to believe that a young woman, a young mother does not have that kind of cruel capacity to premeditate a crime. So the defense is shooting for, no pun intended, the defense is trying to get manslaughter here, that it wasn't an intentional act, that she didn't go there with the intent to kill, that something happened to intervene that caused the accidental death of the victim. Let's go back live into the courtroom. I believe the judge is speaking right now. Okay, so we got an update there in the court. The judge will allow the audio portion of that body cam footage to be brought into evidence. This is the Asenia Sesmas case, a woman who is on trial for the murder of Laura Barca and the kidnapping of her baby, baby Sophia. As this is all outside the presence of the jury right now, they're, so, they're going over witnesses and evidence that may be allowed in for the jury to evaluate. One of the weirdest things about this case, I'm here again with Francie Hakes, Francie, one of the weirdest things about this case is the motive here. So if I get this correct, the defendant was pregnant and she had a miscarriage, and that's what drove her to commit this crime if you, if, uh, or allegedly commit this crime? You know, statistic, FBI statistics show us that when infants are kidnapped, it is almost always in this circumstance. That is someone who wants a child versus someone who wants to hurt a child. So motive here, I think, is pretty clear. It's pretty clear that she wanted a baby. She knew someone who had had a baby, and she was determined, no matter the cost, to get that baby. But it wasn't even she wanted the baby. She was pregnant. She had a miscarriage. She still had a bump and continued to eat and make it look like she was pregnant. She steals the baby and then passes it off as her own. That's what makes this uh, a really, really disturbing case. Um, and there's a lot to cover in here. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a quick break, uh, Francie. So stay, stand by. I have a lot more questions for you. Um, and your knowledge has been great on this so far. Um, so a lot, of, lot to talk about. Um, we're going to take a break. We'll come back with the live feed. This is a really chilling case. That is the defendant, Yesenia Sesmas. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network and Law and Crime on Sirius XM Radio Channel 109. I'm Jesse Weber, and that is a live feed for all of our viewers and our listeners into the Yesenia Sesmas case out of Kansas. This woman who is on trial for the murder of a young mother named Laura Barca. It's alleged that she shot her in the head in her apartment and then, as if you couldn't make matters worse, stole her baby. That's right, six-day-old baby Sophia. The prosecution is continuing their case. What's happening right now is outside of the presence of the jury, certain evidence and witnesses are being examined to determine if they are admissible in front of the jury. The witness on the stand right now is Dr. Scott Kipper, the medical examiner. So let's listen in live. Turn to the side. To, to... Welcome back to Law and Crime, everybody. This is Jesse Weber, and this is a live feed into the Asenia Sesmas case out of Kansas, a woman who is on trial for the murder of Laura Abarca a young mother, as well as the kidnapping of her baby, six-day-old baby Sophia. On the stand right now is Dr. Scott Kipper, a, the medical examiner in this case. It should be noted that the jury is present now. They are listening to this testimony, and Dr. Scott Kipper is going over the actual autopsy photos of Laura Barker. You see her there uh, with the bullet wound in the front of her head. I, war I warn our viewers that this is very graphic content. Um, I want to bring back in uh, Francie Hakes. Uh, former federal prosecutor. The jury is listening to this. And what did we learn? That there were no defensive wounds on uh, Ms. Abarca. What do you make of that? Well, Jesse, it's creating a very clear picture that there was no struggle. The medical examiner testified that there was blood drops on the top of Ms. Abarca's forearms, meaning after she was shot and bleeding, she was in the same position, seated. What this looks like is a helpless victim who was executed. That's certainly what the medical examiner appears to be presenting, and it's going to be shocking to the jury, I think. Definitely will be. Uh, let's go back live into the courtroom. This is a live feed, and this is the Asenia Says Must case. 
We just learned something very interesting now in the Asenia Sesmas case. Welcome back to Law and Crime, everybody. I'm Jesse Weber. On the stand right now is Dr. Scott Kipper, the medical examiner, trying to did the autopsy of Laura Barca, the victim in this case, who was shot in the head. Now, what did we just learn? We learned, according to him, it's possible the gun was pressed up against the forehead of the victim. Let's bring back in Francie Hakes. That changes the dynamic of this case a little bit. From what we heard yesterday, the gun was at close range. But now if it was pressed up against the, the forehead, well, I mean, that's, uh, that's pretty interesting. It is. It's incredibly significant as far as the crime itself. What really happened? Was this a cold-blooded murder or was there some sort of struggle? And this, with the positioning of the victim and all the testimony by the medical examiner just now, the star or stellate pattern in the victim's forehead indicates very clearly to the medical examiner that the gun was pressed up against the forehead because that that star stellate pattern shows that the gases that expel the bullet have reacted to the victim's skin, and that shows the medical examiner that that gun was pressed up against the victim's forehead while she was seated, and it makes it look very clearly like a cold-blooded execution. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll jump back into the Asenia Sesmas case. Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network and Law and Crime on Sirius XM Radio Channel 109. I'm Jesse Weber, and I'm guiding you through this new case that we are covering here on the network, the Yesenia Sesmas case. A woman, a Mexican national, an illegal, who is actually on trial right now for the murder of a young mother named Laura Abarca. She's accused of shooting her in the front of the head in her apartment, and not only that, stealing her baby afterwards, her six-day-old baby. On the stand right now is Dr. Scott Kipper, the medical examiner, who's talking about the close-range aspect of this gunshot wound. He did the autopsy of Laura's body, and what we just learned is it's possible this gun was pressed right into the forehead, which would indicate that this was not an accident, this was not a struggle, but that this really was a cold cold-blooded murder. That's really what it, it appears to be. Uh, it should also be noted that he said... Um, that Laura probably died instantly, that the gun, that the bullet went from front to back, from left to right. Um, there was no evidence of any toxicology or medications or drug abuse. Um, the, and he said the cause of the gunshot to the head was, was a homicide. That was what he said and not a suicide. The defense is about to cross-examine this witness. Um, so I have with me a very special guest, Francie Hakes. But Francie, stand by. We're going to jump into the courtroom. The defense is about to cross-examine the medical examiner. Let's go. <clears throat> Welcome back to Law and Crime, everybody. This is the live feed into the Asenia Sesmas case, a woman who is on trial for the murder of Laura Barca, as well as the kidnapping of her baby girl. Uh, this is Dr. Scott Kipper, the medical examiner, who did the autopsy of Laura Barca. Under the cross-examination by the defense, it was some interesting strategy there. Let's bring back in former federal prosecutor Francie Hakes. What did you think of the questioning by the defense there? Well, that was the method, what I call get in and get out. Try to make a couple of points and sit down. It's obvious that this witness is killing the defense. And so they don't want him on the stand any longer. They want to get him down. They want the jury to forget that he basically has said that what the defendant did was stand over the victim, put a gun against her forehead, and pull the trigger. Did the the questioning about whether or not this death was instantaneous, is that kind of saying, look, if she died immediately right there on the spot, then prosecution, how could you say that my client should have called an ambulance? Um, she should have done this. She should have done that. Because the, 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 the prosecution said if this really was an accident, why didn't she do more to save Miss Abarca? Is that the flavor of what the argument you're getting there? It could have been that. There also could be in the charges, there may be some elements of pain and suffering. And so the defense may be trying to establish that there wasn't any, that there was no opportunity for the victim to suffer. Uh, I'm not sure, but either of those could be possibilities here. And then the questioning about um, this defense attorney loves his definitions. That was the defense's opening statement. What is the definition of intentional? What's the definition of homicide? What's the definition of reckless? Uh, Questioning the medical examiner about legal concepts, what was the idea there? 
really, it was just Jesse to distract from the gruesome nature of his testimony and his conclusions about the kind of killing that this appears to be. Yeah. Um, so everybody, I, this just in, so this is a live feed into the Asenia Sesmas case, but we have an update for you in the Sean Harrison case out of Massachusetts. That was that reverend who was on trial for, um, he was allegedly he was saying that he was leading a double life. He was a, a dean at the English high school, um, but he was really, they were saying that he was actually a, a drug dealer and a drug kingpin. So he was on trial for gun charges, drug charges, as well as charges in connection with the attempted murder of a high school student named Luis Rodriguez. It's alleged that Rodriguez was working for Harrison. They got into a dispute over drug sales, and Harrison tried to kill him by shooting him execution style in the back of the head. Well, here's what we have. We have an update. Oh, sorry, everybody. I just dropped my, uh, my piece. Excuse me. This happens. This happens. I hope everyone can hear me. If not, I'll be back in a second. Okay, that's fine. Anyway, here's what happened. So we have a verdict has been reached in Harrison. Um, he has entered the courtroom. Uh, the only information that we have there is from our local reporter. So we're unfortunately we're going to have to announce the verdict. Um, but we're uh, but here's the thing. Um, we won't be getting the, we won't be able to go in the courtroom live. So we'll get the video shortly and uh, we'll announce the verdict then. Um, I just want to make sure um, that we do we have the verdict right now. Let's see. Um, we do have the verdict for you, but we might wait on that. We might wait to give it to you. So stand by. We're going to get to that in a second. Uh, let's jump back into the Sesmas case. Let's see if we have the live feed in there. Um, I think they might be going into another witness right now. Um, let's see if we have the feed. Do we have the feed, guys? Uh, maybe not. Uh, let's bring back in Francie Hakes. Francie, I don't want you to give away the verdict in Harrison in case you found it out, but we are waiting to hear that. A new witness is now back on the stand in Sesmas. She appears to be having a translator. This could very well be, this could very well be the um, the mother of Laura Abarca. She appears to be having a translator with her. So we've seen a lot of witnesses who don't speak English. They've had translators with them. Um, so let's jump into that courtroom right now, and we'll give you an update about the Harrison case as soon as we have it. Stay tuned. So this is, again, the Asenia Sesmas case. Yeah. Welcome back to Law & Crime, everybody. Sorry about that little technical mishap, but don't worry. Don't worry. We have for you right now the verdict in the Sean Harrison case. So we are going to jump out of the Asenia Sesmas case. We have the verdict for you, okay? He was charged with 10 separate counts. There were gun charges, gun possession charges, drug charges. But really what we wanted to know about that attempted murder of Luis Rodriguez, we're talking about the Reverend, the Rev, Sean Harrison, the man who was a dean at the English high school, who was claimed to really be leading a double life as a drug kingpin, who, said, who was alleged to have hired Luis Rodriguez, another high school student, to sell drugs for him. And when they got into a fight about... Decreased drug sales. It was alleged that Harrison lured him out one night and shot him in the back of the head, execution style. The jury came back, and they found him guilty on all 10 counts. All 10 counts, and that includes the armed assault with intent to murder charge. He was found guilty of that, and that carries with it a 5 to 20, year in 20 years in prison sentence. There you go. The Reverend Sean Harrison, guilty across the board. Uh, let's bring back in Francie Hakes. Francie, are you surprised by that? No. I mean, I also wouldn't have been surprised if there were some acquittals on some of the charges as well. But it sounds like the jury did a really good job of assessing the credibility of the witnesses, understanding that when you're talking about cooperating co-defendants, cooperating drug dealers, they're not going to be the greatest character people. But you had really good corroboration with the physical evidence that was found on the property where the Reverend lived. So it makes a lot of sense that the jury reached this verdict. And you know, it certainly calls into question the defense's decision not to call any witnesses, which was a calculated strategy. But um, I wonder if they're regretting that now. Maybe. Maybe. that's. Uh, we'll have to see what happens. I mean, they're eventually, uh, we're, we're going to update our viewers and listeners about the sentencing aspect of this. But again, Sean Harrison, guilty of armed assault with intent to murder, guilty of aggravated assault and battery with a dangerous weapon, 
guilty of two counts of unlawful possession of a firearm, guilty of two counts of unlawful possession of ammunition, guilty of possession of a firearm in the commission of a felony, guilty of unlawful possession of a shotgun, guilty of unlawful possession of a rifle, and finally guilty of possession of a Class D substance with intent to distribute. That was the Sean Harrison case. We will update you about sentencing and any further uh, news that occurs with the, the Rev, the Rev, the man who is now, you can say, was really leading a double life as a drug kingpin. We, were gonna, we are going to jump right now back into the Yesenia Sesmas case. This woman who is on trial for the murder of Laura Barca and the kidnapping of her baby girl, baby Sophia. Let's go live into that courtroom. Welcome back to Law and Crime, everybody. That's a live feed into the Asenia Sesmas case, a woman who is on trial for the murder of a young mother named Laura Abarca, as well as the kidnapping of her baby girl, six-day-old baby Sophia. It should be noted, baby Sophia is okay. She was recovered, thankfully. Um, but what you're listening to right now is a live feed into that courtroom, and Guadalupe Nogueta is on the stand, stand. Excuse me. That is the mother of the victim, Laura Abarca, as well as the grandmother of baby Sophia want to bring back in former federal prosecutor Francie Hakes. Francie, what do you think about this, um, this witness's testimony? It must be incredibly hard for her to be there. You know, it must be, and you could see in her face when she first took the stand that she was nervous, anxious, and upset. And it'll be very interesting to see how this testimony ends, how much information she has to give to the jury. But what she's given them so far is highly significant, that there was a long-term relationship between the defendant and the victim. This wasn't someone who stalked the victim, found her, shot her, and took her baby. This was a friend. She dropped by. She talked about coming from the gym. She talked about moving into the apartment complex. So I think that for the jury, that will be all the more difficult for them to understand when one friend has killed another. Especially when you look at the crime scene and there was no forced entry and there was no defensive wounds on the victim, it would appear as if the perpetrator of this crime was somebody she knew and somebody she trusted. We'll take a quick break. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody, to the Law and Crime Network. I'm your host this afternoon, Rachel Stockman, and a special hello to our Sirius XM listeners. We are inside a very fascinating case out of the Kansas area. A woman is facing kidnapping and murder charges. Investigators allege she stole a baby and then killed the baby's mother to get that baby. Uh, this was all part of a premeditated plan, according to prosecutors. The defense trying to argue this was not intentional. We'll see how that fares. We just had the victim's mother on the stand with some very emotional testimony. I'm here alongside Francie Hakes, a former federal prosecutor. She's on the line with us. What do you make of this testimony, Francie? It's always a tricky thing when the victim's mother testifies. And the prosecutor was very careful to try to take her through a few key pieces of evidence, basically identifying the long-term relationship between the defendant and the victim while avoiding her getting too emotional and drawing an objection from the defense. And interestingly, Rachel, you saw the defense decline to question the witness. They just don't want that emotional victim's mother on the stand a minute longer than she has to be. Yeah, I was. that was interesting. I was wondering if the defense would have any cross there, but they didn't. They also, you know, she really talked about how she even took out an insurance policy for this child, because if the defense is trying to say that she always wanted to give uh, this baby to Yesenia, uh, that doesn't really jive there, does it? No, it's, it's a ridiculous defense, but it's something that the defendant came up with on the fly when she was originally questioned uh, in order to justify somehow the crime in her mind. And I, I don't think it's going to work. I don't think the jury's going to buy it, but it's a really interesting case to watch. Tragic, but interesting. 
It certainly is, and we are keeping a very close watch on that case. It's going on in the Wichita, Kansas area. We have a crew in the courtroom just told that there's going to be a short break in the case. Uh, they're on central time, so it's not their lunch break. It just looks like they'll probably be gone for a few minutes and then call some more witnesses on the stand. I guess my biggest question, uh, Francie, about this case is, why did it go to trial? I mean, you have some pretty damning evidence. You have eyewitness accounts. You have the gun, uh, ballistics matching the gun that was found at the suspect at the defendant's home. Um, you have text mess. Well, I guess you wouldn't call them text messages, but uh, communication on that what's up, what's up. Um, why did this go to trial? I, Rachel, I think I like to call this the roll the dice strategy, where there is so much evidence of guilt piled up and so much evidence of premeditated murder piled up that there was no real reason for them not to roll the dice, try to inject some kind of legal issue into the case so that it could get reversed on appeal, and then the prosecution would be in a different bargaining position, at least that's the defense theory, so then they might offer a plea to a lower level offense to avoid having to go to trial again. It's really roll your roll the dice. It certainly is. And I think my colleague Jesse Weber said earlier when we were watching the defense attorney's uh, openings, it wasn't exactly a vigorous defense. He was basically reading the requirements of a law school exam on what's the difference between premeditated murder, recklessness, et cetera. I don't know if you got a chance to see the openings, Francie, but I thought they were a bit odd. Well, it was odd. I mean, I think it's clear here that they don't want to offend the jury by being overly um, clever or tricky and trying to make up a defense that simply doesn't exist. I think they're making an argument like they have to. They're advocating for their client to try to get one of the lesser offenses instead of the highest level murder charge as, uh, as a conviction. But I, it does seem to me that for the defense, guilty is a foregone conclusion and they're acting like it. All right, very interesting case. We're falling out of the Kansas area. If you're just joining us, that's the case of Yesenia Semas, Sesmas, and she is facing kidnapping and murder charges for allegedly killing a mother and then abducting a six-day-old baby and fleeing uh, Wichita, Kansas, and taking that baby to Texas where uh, investigators were able to locate that child. Very, very... Uh, it's a very upsetting case that really kind of pulls at your heartstrings. And yesterday on the stand was the father of that six-year-old, ba uh, six-day-old baby. Now Sophia is about two. Take a listen to some of what he had to say. And welcome back, everybody, to the Long Crime Trial Network and our listeners in Sirius XM Radio. You're listening right now to testimony from the Yesenia Sesmas trial that we're following out of the Wichita, Kansas area. Very interesting case of a woman who's facing murder and kidnapping charges for stealing a baby, well, first murdering the mother of that baby, then taking a six-day-old baby with her kidnapping the baby and escaping to Texas. She told he, she later told police she had plans to take that baby to Mexico. Uh, you were just listening to testimony from the biological father of that child. Uh, he didn't want his face to be seen on camera, which is why you had a shot where you couldn't actually see him. Um, I'm here with Francie still, uh, who's a former federal prosecutor. Francie, you heard a little bit of that testimony from the, the father who said, no, we didn't have any intentions. And there's the picture you just saw on the screen there of the little baby with the parents. We had no intentions of giving this baby away to anyone. We, we wanted to raise the baby. We were excited. We bought toys. Um, how does that play into the defense's argument? Because, of course, Yesenia is trying to say that this was all some kind of plan where the mom was going to give her that baby. 
Yeah, Rachel, the defense has one shot, really. They have to try to make the jury believe that this was not a premeditated, cold-blooded killing, that there was a misunderstanding, a fight, an argument, a crime of passion. It's the only thing that will allow the jury to ignore whatever the other evidence is and convict her of the highest level murder charge. So it's really the only thing they have is to argue that there was a misunderstanding and the father just destroyed that. But the defense will no doubt still take that tact in closing because the one person who would have the evidence, if it existed, of this agreement to give away the child uh, cannot testify because she's been murdered. Listen, uh, this is going to be a tough one uh, for the defense, especially, you know, it's going to be one of these where I even wonder what kind of defense witnesses they may even bring. Will Yesenia herself take the stand? Uh, there's no insanity defense in, in Kansas for this. So that kind of could have been something the defense pro maybe could have gone down that route, perhaps. But it makes it more difficult when you as a defense attorney don't have that option. It definitely does. I mean, they're, they are certainly behind the eight ball on this. The defense is. The evidence is overwhelming. The medical examiner testified earlier this morning that the gun was pressed directly against Laura's forehead. Um, to commit the crime. No the sign of struggle. There's, yeah. If this was some kind of accident where things got heated, you would have thought the medical examiner or some of the other uh, witnesses like the investigators would have testified to the fact that in the crime scene uh, there were things out of place, she had other injuries on her body, but this was almost a point blank range when she was shot. Well, it absolutely was. The gun, the medical examiner testified because of the star stellate pattern mm -hmm. of wound on the forehead, the gun was pressed directly up against Laura's forehead, and the angle of the trajectory of the bullet that he testified about suggests that whoever uh, pulled the trigger was standing over Laura, which makes it look very much like an execution-style cold-blooded killing. Very, very disturbing stuff. So. We are monitoring this case, and as soon as they get back, and Francie's going to stick with us for a few more minutes. I know you have to go soon. Um, but as soon as they get back from their brief break, we'll take you back live to the courtroom in Wichita, Kansas, where the Yesenia Sesmas case is going on. We'll see what other witnesses that the prosecution calls up to the stand. In the meantime, we have a lot of other big stories going on that we've been covering here at Law & Crime. Let's take a listen to today's top story. Stories. All right, a uh, lot going on across the country and, of course, here on Law and Crime as we keep our eye on several uh, trials going on, including this one that we've been talking about all morning, the Yesenia Sesmas case that's going on in Wichita, Kansas. I'm here alongside Francie Hakes, a former federal prosecutor, current criminal defense attorney. And as part of our top crime stories, you saw this one case that has really been going viral for the last couple of days involving that uh, takedown in the New Jersey Beach, a uh, Philadelphia woman who's seen being punched in the head by a police officer. We finally get the body cam video because before we had just seen that video from another woman at the beach. And it doesn't seem to quite line up with what police had originally said. I guess, first off, why is it necessary on a beach when people are just, I guess, enjoying themselves for such an arrest to happen like that? It seemed like totally over the top to me. Rachel, first, just a quick clarification. I'm, I'm not a criminal defense attorney. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. I'm totally fine. Uh, but as far as this video goes, it is very disturbing. Oftentimes, these police videos are very disturbing, mostly because we never seem to get the full context of it. And you all almost always have these offenders or accused people yelling and screaming, get off me, what are you doing? And it's it looks very violent. And in this case, there may be misconduct. I definitely want to know more about what led up to this particular encounter. But you're right. It does seem to be excessive when you've got someone potentially with an open container violating the law, You go, which is a relatively low-level offense, let's be honest. Going from there to, to being uh, in a violent struggle with the police, how did you get from one place to there? 
Well, and there's a lot of questions on all of this. I know the officers involved in this have been put on administrative leave. The mayor of the town where this happened is still defending the police department. There's going to be a lot of fallout, and we'll continue to monitor what happens on lawandcrime.com as we continue to also monitor many of the top criminal trials going on across the country. In just a few minutes, we're going to take you back live inside the case we've been following in Wichita, Kansas, a really unbelievable case involving that woman accused of kidnapping a baby and killing the baby's mother. But let's first take a quick break, and we'll be right back. Welcome back to Law and & Crime and to our listeners on Sirius XM Radio. A lot going on here on the network and across the country as we continue to monitor some of the top criminal trials going on and cases of interest going on across the country right now. We are inside a Wichita, Kansas trial where a woman named Yesenia Sesmas is uh, being accused of murder, first-degree murder and kidnapping for allegedly taking a six-day-old baby from a mother, killing the mother, and then escaping to Texas where investigators found her. She said she told police in an interview after she was captured that this mother had actually promised to give her the baby. Prosecutors, police, they aren't buying that. They're saying that this was a premeditated murder, that she planned this, and that she had no intention uh, of giving that baby back in any way. I'm here alongside Francie Hakes, a former federal prosecutor who's been watching some of the testimony all morning with us. Uh, I'm told we do have a feed back in court, but nothing's happening yet. So as soon as we do see some more witnesses called to the stand, of course, we will take you back there live. Uh, of anything, what do you think was the most important thing, Francie, that came so far out of the testimony from this morning? Well, Rachel, I think that the medical examiner's testimony was incredibly significant because it showed us that the wound itself, the gunshot itself, the killing shot was done with the gun pressed up against the forehead of Laura Abarca. And that suggests a premeditated murder, as well as the angle of the trajectory of the bullet, the fact that there were no defensive wounds, the blood on her forearms suggests that she was always in a seated position, all show that she was effectively helpless and executed. Yeah, and it's going to be very interesting, like we've been saying, where's the defense going with this? Because honestly, I usually get a pretty good idea when the defense decides to give opening statements. Okay, this is where they're going to take the case. They're not going to say she wasn't there, but they're going to try to, you know, get her off the hook for the first degree murder charges. But the opening statement by Yesenia's uh, defense attorney, I have to say, really didn't give me any clue whatsoever why they took this to trial or where they were really trying to go with the defense. I would have probably just said to the defense attorney, you might as well just wa wave that opening for now if you're going to go that route. <laughs> that's my opinion on it, though. No, that's a great, um, that's a great opinion, Rachel, and, and that's a great point. I think here the defense really seems to be struggling to figure out what they're doing and how they're going to do it, and it just looks very ad hoc to me, like they just really went in without a big plan other than trying to inject some sort of legal error so that it get reversed, it get reversed later on appeal. And Francie, I want to thank you so much for joining us here on the Law and Crime Network. I know your time with us is up, and it looks like we have a live feed right now inside the courtroom. Another witness is, was sworn in and is taking the stand, introducing himself. Again, this is the case of Yesenia Sesma. She is facing first-degree murder charges and also kidnapping charges. Horrific story. Prosecutors say she stole a baby from the mother, killed the mother, escaped to Texas, and apparently was planning to run away to Mexico. Let's take a listen now to uh, the witness on the stand. 